I uh, would like to welcome everyone to this uh, session on Marxism and the environment. Uh, my name is uh, Stefan. I'm uh, from the IMT in Sweden, and uh, I will be chairing today's uh, session. Uh, first, uh, we have some practical information to make sure that everything goes smoothly. And for those of you joining uh, just now, uh, you will note uh, that there are pauses all the time when people speak. And uh, this is because this session is translated into 12 languages, Spanish, French, Chinese, etc. And we have to pause uh, for the translation. To see the schedule for the school, please uh, go to the events page. And uh, on the left, you will see a button with a star. You can see the two other sessions simultaneous to this one, and you can see uh, the rest of the school there. Uh, you can find the translations uh, on the same page uh, if you click uh, on the button with a speech symbol. Uh, so if you're not already in there, navigate to the correct language and join the Discord server. Yeah, the user manual for Discord is also in the email inviting you to the school. Now, uh, this uh, discussion on the, the environment is uh, a key question for obvious reasons. One which uh, concerns not only the future of uh, the planet, but potentially of uh, human civilization and the human species itself. So I'm proud to present our speaker, Jack Halinski Fitzpatrick, who works for Well Read Books. Uh, the publishing house of uh, the International Marxist uh, Tendency, which uh, publishes a wealth of Marxist uh, literature. Uh, Jack will speak for about uh, 90 minutes, including translation. And there will be a 25 minute break after his lead off. Uh, and after that, we will have a number of comrades who will uh, contribute to the discussion before Jack sums up. So uh, without further ado, I uh, will, would like to uh, ask uh, Jack to come in. Welcome, Jack.
The question of climate change is no longer a thing of the future. Freak weather events are becoming more common. Forests are burning. And people are dying from heat waves, drought, floods and famine. Two years ago, a report was released by the IPCC that modeled the effects of climate change. They concluded that unless global temperature rises were limited to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels, a tipping point could be reached. It points to a future where humanity would be driven to mass displacement, war over natural resources and barbarism. But to keep temperature rises to below this level, would require a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And what has been the response? Well, according to the UN, Governments are planning to produce 120% more fossil fuels than would be consistent with meeting this target. But this prospect has not been completely unanswered. Last year saw millions of young people begin to fight back. In September 2019 alone, six million people took part in the Fridays for Future climate strikes. And these were not just caused by worries about the climate. They are a product of the instability of the system and the radicalization that this is provoking. We can see that there is a large layer of radical young people who were not interested in waiting about for change. Whilst the climate strikes were huge and inspiring, they were unfortunately limited. Firstly, they were not linked up to the labour movement on a systematic basis. But secondly, the labour movement itself really showed no way forward. On top of all of this, they were, to a large extent, derailed by liberal NGOs, green parties,
and groups like Extinction Rebellion. In a certain sense, Extinction Rebellion also reflects the growing radicalization amongst many layers of society. They recognize that letters, emailing and marches don't work. But the alternative that they present is just as impotent. The founder goes on to suggest that instead, the movement needs about 400 people to go to prison and about two to 3,000 to be arrested. So as if by ma magic, once you hit this level, the government just decides to carry out a green transition. They also argue that all classes can be convinced, and so they actively try to depoliticize the movement. One of their main demands is that governments should tell the truth. The trouble is, we live in a world where if the two richest men piled all of their wealth in $100 bills, they would be sat in space. The vast majority, however, would be sat on the floor. For a government that defends this system to tell the truth would therefore be suicide, and it is naive to think that this would be possible. Rather than basing themselves on the only progressive class in society, the working class, they focus instead on stunts. But these stunts at best play a reactionary role by reducing the confidence that workers have in themselves. it could lead to the, to the conclusion that rather than getting actively involved in the fight to change society, it can just be left to a small group. At worst, these actions can play an even more reactionary role by turning workers away from the environmental movement. Others, such as labour left activists in the UK, have campaigned for banks and other corporations to divest from fossil fuels.
Now, first of all, it's quite unlikely that these companies will come under sufficient pressure from these left-wing activists to divest. But even if they did, each time they were able to convince one corporation to divest, the vacuum would just be filled by another. The problem goes deeper than this, though. In one article, The Economist explained that the more renewable energy is deployed, the more it lowers the price of power from any source. Sources of power are a commodity under capitalism. So once there is investment in renewable energy, you have a, uh, a, a new source of very cheap and abundant power. And so as supply increases, the price of all sources of power goes down. You saw this between 2012 and 2016 in the United States. The installation of solar panels increased hugely uh, and costs equally fell uh, by a huge amount. Uh, and one solar panel capitalist described this as a circle of death. He said, with global overcapacity forcing down prices, firms are compelled to produce more to gain the benefits of scale, which further lowers prices. Capitalism is an anarchic system where each capitalist competes against all others to produce a profit. When demand exceeds supply for a particular commodity, capital is directed to that sector. This means that more and more of that particular commodity is produced until supply exceeds demand. But it is impossible for individual capitalists to realize that this point has been reached until it's too late. The realization only comes when the particular commodity produced can no longer be sold for a profit. Since the working class is paid less in wages than the value it creates in the labor process, this causes periodical crises of what is called overproduction.
too many commodities are produced to be profitably absorbed by the market. And this is, of course, much the same with sources of energy. And the point as well to make is that this problem would only be exacerbated if governments were to introduce subsidies for green energy. It would only lead to markets becoming even more glutted and so drive the sector into an even deeper crisis. So if we are to avoid catastrophic climate change by keeping global warming to below that 1.5 degrees Celsius level, we require an energy transition far quicker and more radical than anything we have ever seen. So these periodic crises that capitalism goes into act as a barrier to this quick transition. Now, one idea that is gaining followers is the idea of degrowth or zero growth. The idea is that the faster we produce and consume, the more we damage the environment. So they call on the advanced economies to embrace zero or even negative GDP growth. But environmental damage is not caused by industrialization or growth as such. But by the way, it's uh, but by the way, production is organized and controlled. And we can see that already because the introduction of renewable energy has meant that energy emissions no longer rise in lockstep with economic growth. And so the point to, me, to be made is that if we had a democratically planned economy which properly utilized renewables and rationally allocated energy and resources, We could bring about an absolute uncoupling. So economic growth has no impact on emissions. Now linked also to these ideas is the idea of overpopulation.
I speak to you here from uh, Britain. Various members of the British royal family, for example, have said that the biggest problem facing the environment today is overpopulation. Unfortunately, that uh, does not mean that they limit their own population. But anyway, the first thing I would say to recognize is that large families have a material base. In developing countries, rural families have to rely on having many uh, children. Because in the absence of a welfare state, then parents need to rely on their children to support them when they get older. And as evidence of this, we've seen declining fertility rates across the world as countries urbanize and develop. So if you had an economy where everyone's needs were met, then that would be one way uh, of limiting population, if that really was your aim. But of course, the British royal family are not in favour of this. But the main thing to say against this argument is that we are very far away from having reached a limit in terms of how many humans the earth can support. The ideas that are put forward here are really just a reheated version of the ideas of Thomas Malthus. He was an early 19th century economist who asserted that famine, poverty and disease were all products of overpopulation. But his ideas were disproved because with advances in agricultural technique, a bigger population could be supported. The bigger surplus that was produced enabled a bigger population to be supported with, uh, with high nutritional levels. And his ideas are still wrong today. We produce enough now to feed 10 billion people on the planet. And the technology already exists to make the complete transition to renewable power. So more people does not necessarily have to mean more emissions.
Again, using the same sort of logic, there are those who argue that if we all just consume a little less, then we'll be able to save the planet. The Global Footprint Network, for example, marks Earth Overshoot Day. This is the day, according to them, when humanity has used up nature's resource budget for the year. So to deal with this, we have uh, people who suggest that we stop eating meat. We have people who uh, launch campaigns against so-called fast fashion. But the first question to ask these people is just who is it that they are suggesting consumes too much? In 2016, the UN estimated that 815 people were suffering from chronic undernourishment. And this will only be exacerbated by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, regarding fast fashion also. Uh, the National Education Union in the United Kingdom surveyed teachers on child poverty. They reported children wearing clothing that was ill-fitting, others with holes in their shoes. Um, <clears throat> and others attending school in the winter who had no coats. This is in advanced, the advanced United Kingdom. After a period where workers have suffered brutal austerity, to talk about consumerism really to most people is a sick joke. But even after considering this, where does this consumerism come from? Capitalism requires capital to be constantly flowing around the system. It needs us to spend, spend, spend. And to manage this, huge amounts of resources are directed towards the advertising industry. This is an entire industry that's aimed to make humans feel worthless so that they feel that they have to consume. And on top of this, even if you were convinced by all of these campaigns,
increasingly, products are designed with an artificially limited life. Many people watching may have experienced this when they buy a mobile phone or a laptop, maybe. It seems like clockwork. As soon as the warranty expires, it breaks. But this is incredibly useful for a capitalist. If you're a capitalist and you sell someone a phone that's perfect and works forever, how would you sell them that person another phone? So under capitalism, there is a disincentive to produce high quality products within reason, of course. What all of these theories do is uh, place blame for the capitalist, uh, for the climate crisis on working class people themselves. But the real culprit is not the actions of workers, it's capitalism and the capitalists themselves. Just to give some figures, less than 10% of waste that is sent to landfills is from households. Over 70% of greenhouse gas emissions are produced by 100 big companies. And just 20 companies have produced uh, one third of all CO2 produced since 1965. So rather than blame those who are actually responsible, we're encouraged to blame ourselves or others. This acts also therefore to greenwash austerity because cuts to living standards are justified in order to save the planet. But even if, even if it was possible to convince every individual to stop consuming, would this even work? Well, in response to the coronavirus pandemic, many countries introduced stringent lockdowns. Flights were grounded, shops were shut. People did, to a large extent, stop consuming. And what impact did this have? Well, the International Energy Agency expects global greenhouse gas emissions to be 8% lower in 2020 than in 2019. 
So even if people endure these huge changes to, way, to the way they live their lives, we would still have 90% of the necessary decarbonization still left to do. And what also has this shutdown brought with it? It has brought possibly the deepest capitalist crisis in history, which brings massive unemployment and eventually brutal austerity. So that just shows capitalism requires us to consume. And if we stop, the system goes into crisis. And this only brings unemployment and suffering for the working class. Now, instead of these individualistic solutions, there are some who propose things like carbon taxes. Ian Parry, an economist at the World Bank, for example, argues for a carbon tax of about $35 per tonne. Apologies, I've lost the Spanish translation. Okay, could I just check with the translation team that I'm back? Jack, I uh, think uh, that there was, uh, Dave, you lost them and uh, you will need to restart the Discord or possibly take someone else's Discord to, while Apologies you- for this, it's never going phone. to go entirely smoothly. Restart Discord, yeah. Okay, I think I'm back. Yeah, you think you're back. Just one more check. Okay, good, panic over. <clears throat> okay, um, so Ian Parry, um, an economist at the World Bank, the, his, his plan though, um, would raise the price of petrol by about 10% and the price of electricity by about 25%. And this he puts forward as the best way to make sure that countries meet their emissions pledges. However, in the UK in 2016, 10% of the population were in what's called fuel poverty. And what has that meant? Well, in the winter of 2017 in the UK, 
there were 46,000 excess deaths amongst elderly people, as many can't afford to heat their homes properly. So a carbon tax would hit the poorest hardest and push more people into fuel poverty. We are opposed to making the working class pay for the climate crisis. So we should support the Yellow Vests movement, which was itself sparked by a proposal to introduce a fuel tax. Or the uprising in Ecuador, which was itself sparked by a plan to reduce fuel subsidies. Now elsewhere, there are those who argue for what is called a Green New Deal. This is inspired by the kind of Keynesian policies that were introduced in the US um, before the post-war uh, upswing. The idea is government-led investment in green technologies and funding this through taxation. And the aim would be to stimulate demand and boost consumption. Now, the Green New Deal is certainly a step forward compared to many of these individualistic solutions. Climate change is at least here presented as a political question. But the question that must be asked is where will the money come from? because governments don't have money of their own. They can only get it through borrowing, through taxation or printing money. And when it comes to taxation, the government can choose to tax the workers or can tax the capitalists. but taxing workers merely cuts their consuming power and so reduces demand in the economy. Which is of course the opposite of what the stimulus is intended to do. Taxes on the capitalists on the other hand mean biting into the profits of the capitalists. And this can create a, a strike of capital, capitalists refusing to invest. So taxation can only stimulate demand by suppressing it elsewhere.
uh, borrowing as well brings its own uh, problems. Governments already around the world were in a huge amount of debt, and this has only been exacerbated by the coronavirus pandemic, the response to it. Now, some, like Ocasio-Cortez in the United States, contends that the Green New Deal will pay for itself through growth. But is this possible? Well, if you look at uh, US government debt as a percentage of GDP, In 1946, this stood at 119%. And following this, the post-war upswing did allow uh, the United States to reduce this level to 31% in 1974. But we are living in a completely different period today. And the thing to recognize was that the post-war upswing was not caused by the policies of the New Deal. After all, it was not until after 1945 that the world, uh, world economy began growing again. And this occurred mainly because of the destruction of World War II, which created demands to build the economy back up again. Today, on the other hand, world markets are saturated. Just to give some figures again, capacity utilization in both the United States and Euro area stands at under 70% today. And whilst in China, it is around 74%. What this means is that most countries are not utilizing the productive capacity that they already have. Why is that? It's because there is not enough demand in the economy due to the crisis. So it's not a question of a lack of money to invest, but it's due to the organic crisis of capitalism. And so this can't be solved simply by pumping more money into the economy. Because this would only exacerbate the problem of overproduction. Now, ultimately, capitalism is incapable of bringing about the changes that are needed quickly enough.
almost all of the IPCC's models require the uh, require negative emissions. So they need us to uh, suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. Now this could be done through low tech means such as reforestation. But there are also some uh, more high tech potential solutions such as enhanced weathering. Now, I won't go into this uh, in too much detail because this is uh, quite a speculative technology at the moment and would require an enormous amount of investment to enter the running as a plausible alternative. But the point I would like to make is that this investment is not being carried out by capitalists. Why? Because it's not possible to make money out of it. The only reason for capitalists to invest in anything is to make a profit. But you don't have to take my word from it. I've got a quote from The Economist here. They say, though renewable energy could profitably generate a fair share of the world's electricity, nobody knows how to get rich simply by removing greenhouse gases. So there you have it. Because no one knows how to make it profitable to suck greenhouse gases out of the environment, it is not done. <clears throat> now this uh, drive to produce uh, in order to produce a profit also encourages companies to cut corners and drive down standards. Just one example of this is the Volkswagen emission scandal. Here, they installed a defeat device, which could basically, uh, it could recognize when the car was being tested. they could then change the performance accordingly in order to improve their results. So it allowed the company to appear as though they were meeting regulations, but they were able to do that whilst avoiding reducing the performance of the car.
Now, it is, of course, true that this is only one scandal. But the point to recognize is that capitalism is a system that rewards those who cheat, provided they uh, get away with it. Now, side by side with this barrier of profit is that of the nation state. Um, it's a very uncontroversial statement to say that international cooperation is needed in order to bring about the sort of change that we need. This would be both to mitigate against the impacts of climate change that we are already seeing. But it would also, uh, it's also needed in order to help countries to switch to more green energy sources. Um, just to give one example, in Bangladesh, uh, it's a country where millions of people are at risk from flooding. Uh, there's a situation where Himalayan meltwater and heavy monsoons can inundate the Ganges Delta. But you see a similar problem in the Netherlands, which also sits on, uh, on the delta of a river. <clears throat> but the difference is that in the Netherlands, there is a system of dikes and canals, which, mean that which means that water can be directed to the sea. Uh, in addition to this, you have urban planning, which basically uh, enables uh, that quite basic requirement of homes to be placed outside of floodplains. Essentially, what we see here is that because the Netherlands is a much richer country than Bangladesh, it is possible to deal with this problem. Uh, and in, in, a, in order to deal with, the, with these sorts of disparities, um, the capitalists and their representatives have come up with a solution. Uh, in the Paris Agreement, they nobly resolved to transfer $100 billion a year from the advanced to the developing countries. Uh, and there is a net transfer of wealth that takes place. Each year, $2 trillion flows from the less advanced 
to the more advanced countries in the form of loans, repatriation of profits, and things like this. So that's $2 trillion in the opposite direction than what was intended. Or not intended. What was agreed to apparently at this, uh, in, on, in the Paris Agreement. <clears throat> and this is no accident. Because capitalism divides the world into competing nation states, each of which puts the interests of their own ruling class first. Uh, of course, some international cooperation is possible. When the capitalist system is in a healthy state um, and the economic pie is growing, nation states are capable of making agreements. We have seen the creation of the European Union, for example. But as soon as we enter a period of crisis, each government attempts to export its problems to all the other governments. And what is it that we see today? We see increasing protectionism. We see the breaking apart of international institutions. And we see generalized geopolitical instability. So the material base that the material base for the long for the sort of long lasting international cooperation that is needed in order to deal with the climate crisis just does not exist. We can take solar power as an example. We could um, provide a huge amount of green, clean energy today. If we covered the uninhabitable regions of the Sahara Desert with uh, solar panels, <clears throat> you would then be able to redirect that energy around the globe on the basis of need. Uh, this, this isn't my idea, it was a project that was begun by the German capitalists in the early 2000s. Uh, in order to move away from a reliance on, <clears throat> on, uh, on Russian gas, they established this project, which was called Desert Tech.
The problem was that the energy that was produced by these solar panels would have to be directed through the Spanish state. And in the context of the austerity at that time, there was no question of upgrading the infrastructure to enable this to happen. The Spanish state also had its own ruling class to look after, of course. which included its own domestic fossil fuel industry. So they had no interest in investing in this project. Now, Greta Thunberg once said, if solutions within the system are so impossible to find, maybe we should change the system itself. I would say that the capitalist system has proved incapable of the radical and rapid action that is needed to save the planet. And if it's incapable of fulfilling this quite basic requirement, then surely it is time that it was gotten rid of. Um, now, this IPCC report estimated that each year until 2030, Around $150 billion needs to be invested in renewable and non-fossil fuel sources of energy. On top of this, to reduce overall energy demands, $340 billion is needed to be invested in buildings, transport and industry. But the money to pay for this is there. Every year, $1.7 trillion is spent on military expenditure and the weapons trade. Meanwhile, lying uninvested in the banks of big business is $2 trillion in the US, 2 trillion euros in Europe, and 700 billion pounds in the UK. Um, as I explained earlier, this money is not invested because there is a lack of prof profitable outlets uh, for this investment. To deal with the climate crisis, we need a worldwide plan. This would involve the rapid move from fossil fuels to renewable energy.
we also need to properly rationalize and plan our farming. And we need to mitigate the impact of climate change that are already upon us. However, as the old saying goes, you can't plan what you don't control and you don't control what you don't own. It's the concentration and accumulation of capital that capitalism brings that's brought about this situation that I explained earlier. Where the bulk of all emissions comes from a, a handful of large companies. But this makes things a lot easier for us. It means we just need to nationalize these large corporations and put them under the democratic control of the workers themselves. The workers who work in these industries know far better than the bosses how to run them. Just to give one example. In 1976, the Lucas Aerospace Corporation announced that they were going to cut thousands of jobs um, because of uh, technological change and uh, international competition. Uh, but the workers instead drew up a proposal. They demonstrated that the same factories, machines and employees could be retooled and redeployed. They showed that instead of producing missiles, which the company was producing uh, previously, they could produce renewable technology and advanced healthcare equipment. The workers were eventually sold out by the trade union and labor leaders, but this demonstrates the creative power of the working class. You imagine also we had a democratically planned economy. Rather than combining some of the best minds in the world to think about how to make a new button for a mobile phone, You could instead direct scientists, engineers and others to socially useful areas. Or rather than blaming workers for uh, consuming too much, we were able instead to provide free high quality public transport and free home insulation.
Now, of course, a socialist society wouldn't automatically be green. But a democratically planned socialist economy gives us the tools to ensure that it is. Because with the active participation in the running of society by the working class, it allows society to be run in the interests of need and not profit. Now, the thing, of course, to remember is that no ruling class in history has ever given up its power and privileges without a fight. But history has also shown that there is a power that is far stronger than any ruling class. And that is the working class when they were organized around a socialist program. As the saying goes, not a wheel turns, not a light bulb shines without the kind permission of the working class. because the working class hold power in their hands. And if they are mobilized, they are capable of shutting down society. So whilst it was incredibly inspiring to see the movement of the students on the streets, These protests are not enough if they remain limited in this way. Now, students can and have acted as a, uh, as a spark to the workers' movement in the past. You can just see uh, May 1968 as an example of that. The point is though that students on their own are not capable of changing society. And it's only the working class that has the power to do this. On top of this as well, it's only the working class that has the inclination to change society. The capitalists won't save this planet. They're already living on another one. Uh, and some of them, such as Jeff Bezos, are already researching how to colonize other planets for them to destroy. History has shown that when working people do move into action, there is no lack of self-sacrifice and fighting spirit. What has consistently been lacking instead is a leadership worthy of the name.
And it's the building of this leadership that should be the focus of today. So yes, to stop climate change, we do need system change. But system change will only take place if the working class are organized and led to fundamentally transform society. We need a fundamental transformation to a democratically planned socialist society. That is the only way that we can solve the climate crisis. Thank you.